all began to run and bustle, and Rostov saw coming up the road behind him several riders with white plumes in their hats. In a moment every one was in his place, waiting. Rostov did not know or remember how he ran to his place and mounted. Instantly his regret at not having been in action, and his dejected mood amid people of whom he was weary had gone, instantly every thought of himself had vanished. He was filled with happiness at his nearness to the emperor. He felt that this nearness by itself made up to him for the day he had lost. He was happy as a lover when the longed-for moment of meeting arrives. Not daring to look round and without looking round, he was ecstatically conscious of his approach. He felt it not only from the sound of the hoofs of the approaching cavalcade, but because as he drew near everything grew brighter, more joyful, more significant, and more festive nearer and nearer to Rostov came that sun shedding beams of mild and majestic light around, and already he felt himself enveloped in those beams. The Pavlograd hussars, he inquired. The reserves, sire, replied a voice, a very human one compared to that which had said. The Pavlograd hussars. The emperor drew level with Rostov and halted. Alexander's face was even more beautiful than it had been three days before at the review. It shone with such gaiety and youth, such innocent youth, that it suggested the liveliness of a fourteen-year-old boy, and yet it was the face of the majestic emperor. Casually, while surveying the squadron, the emperor's eyes met Rostov's and rested on them for not more than two seconds. Whether or no the emperor understood what was going on in Rostov's soul, it seemed to Rostov that he understood everything. At any rate, his light blue eyes gazed for about two seconds into Rostov's. A gentle, mild light poured from them. Then, all at once, he raised his eyebrows, abruptly touched his horse with his left foot, and galloped on. The younger emperor could not restrain his wish to be present at the battle and, in spite of the remonstrances of his courtiers, at twelve o'clock left the third column with which he had been and galloped toward the... Before he came up with the hussars, several adjutants met him with news of the successful result of the action. This battle, which consisted in the capture of a French squadron, was represented as a brilliant victory over the French, and so the emperor and the whole army, especially while the smoke hung over... A few minutes after the emperor had passed, the Pavlograd division was ordered to advance. In Wischow itself, a petty German town, Rostov saw the emperor again. In the marketplace, where there had been some rather heavy firing before the emperor's arrival, lay several killed and wounded soldiers whom there had not been time to move. The emperor, surrounded by his suit of officers and courtiers, was riding a bobtailed chestnut mare, a different one from that which he had ridden at the review, and bending to one side, the wounded soldier was so dirty, coarse, and revolting that his proximity to the emperor shocked Rostov. Rostov saw how the emperor's rather round shoulders shuddered as if a cold shiver had run down them, how his left foot began convulsively tapping the horse's side with the spur, and how the welch, an adjutant, dismounting, lifted the soldier under the arms to place him on a stretcher that had been brought. The soldier groaned. Gently, gently, can't you do it more gently? Said the emperor apparently suffering more than the dying soldier, and he rode away. Rostov saw tears filling the emperor's eyes and heard him. As he was riding away, say to Ksartariskai, What a terrible thing war is! What a terrible thing! The emperor's gratitude was announced to the vanguard, rewards were promised, and the men received a double ration of vodka. The campfires crackled and the soldiers' songs resounded even more merrily than on the previous night. Denisov celebrated his promotion to the rank of major, and Rostov, who had already drunk enough, at the end of the feast proposed the emperor's health. Not our sovereign, the emperor, as they say at official dinners, said he, but the health of our sovereign, that good, enchanting, and great man, let us drink and the old cavalry captain, Kirsten, shouted enthusiastically and no less sincerely than the twenty-year-old Rostov. When the officers had emptied and smashed their glasses, 
Kirsten filled others and, in shirt sleeves and breeches, went glass in hand to the soldiers' bonfires and with his long gray lads, ears to our sovereign, the emperor, and victory over our enemies. Hurrah! he exclaimed in his dashing, old hussar's baritone. The hussars crowded round and responded heartily with loud shouts. Late that night, when all had separated, Denisov with his short hand patted his favorite, Rostov, on the shoulder. As there's no one to fall in love with on campaign, he's fallen in love with the Tsar, he said. Denisov, don't make fun of it, cried Rostov. It is such a lofty, beautiful feeling. Such a... I believe it, I believe it, fweened, and I share, and approve, no, you don't understand, and Rostov got, he really was in love with the Tsar and the glory of the Russian arms and the hope of future triumph, and he was not the only man to experience that feeling during those memorable days preceding the Battle of Austerlitz. Nine-tenths of the men in the Russian army were then in love, though less ecstatically. Chapter Xi, the next day the emperor stopped at Wischa, and Villier, his physician, was repeatedly summoned to see him. At headquarters and among the troops nearby the news spread that the emperor was unwell. He ate nothing and had slept badly that night, those around him reported. The cause of this indisposition was the strong impression made on his sensitive mind by the sight of the killed and wounded. At daybreak on the 17th, a French officer, who had come with a flag of truce, demanding an audience with the Russian emperor, was brought into Wischa from our outposts. This officer was Savary. The emperor had only just fallen asleep, and so Savary had to wait. At midday he was admitted to the emperor, and an hour later he rode off with Prince Dolgorukov to the advanced post of the French army. It was rumored that Savary had been sent to propose to Alexander a meeting with Napoleon. To the joy and pride of the whole army, a personal interview was refused, and instead of the sovereign Prince Dolgorukov, the victor at Wischa, was sent with Savary to negotiate. Toward evening Dolgorukov came back, went straight to the Tsar, and remained alone with him for a long time. On the 18th and 19th of November, the army advanced two days' march and the enemy's outposts, after a brief interchange of shots, retreated. In the highest army circles from midday on the 19th, a great, excitedly bustling activity began which lasted till the morning of the 20th, when the memorable Battle of Austerlitz was fought. Till midday on the 19th, the activity, the eager talk, running to and fro, and dispatching of adjutants was confined to the emperor's headquarters. But on the afternoon of that day, this activity reached Kutuzov's headquarters and the staffs of the commanders of columns. By evening, the adjutants had spread it to all ends and parts of the army, and in the night from the 19th to the 20th, the whole 80,000 Allied troops rose from their bivouac. The concentrated activity which had begun at the emperor's headquarters in the morning and had started the whole movement that followed was like the first movement of the main wheel of a large tower clock. One wheel slowly moved, another was set in motion, and a third, and wheels began to revolve faster and faster, levers and cogwheels to work, chimes to play, just as in the mechanism of a clock, so in the mechanism of the military machine, an impulse once given leads to the final result. And just as indifferently quiescent, till the wheels creak on their axles as the cogs engage one another and the revolving pulleys whir with the rapidity of their movement, but a neighboring wheel is as quiet and motionless as though it were prepared to remain so. Just as in a clock, the result of the complicated motion of innumerable wheels and pulleys is merely a slow and regular movement of the hands which show the time, so the result of all the complicated. Prince Andrew was on duty that day and in constant attendance on the commander-in-chief. At six in the evening, Kutuzov went to the emperor's headquarters and after staying but a short time with the Tsar went to see the Grand Marshal of the court, Count Tolstoy. Balkansky took the opportunity to go in to get some details of the coming action from Dolgoruko. He felt that Kutuzov was upset and dissatisfied about something, and that at headquarters they were dissatisfied with him, and also that at the emperor's headquarters everyone adopted toward him the tone of men. 
Well, how do you do, my dear fellow, said Dolgorukov, who was sitting at tea with Bilibin. The feat is for tomorrow. How is your old fellow? Out of sorts, I won't say he is out of sorts, but I fancy he would like to be heard. But they heard him at the council of war and will hear him when he talks sense. Well, what is Bonaparte like? How did he impress you? Yes, I saw him, and am convinced that he fears nothing so much as a general engagement, repeated Dolgoruk. If he weren't afraid of a battle, why did he ask for that interview? Why negotiate, and above all, why retreat when to retreat is so contrary to his method of conducting war? Believe me, his hour has come, mark my words, but tell me what is he like? B, said Prince Andrew again. He is a man in a grey overcoat, very anxious that I should call him your majesty, but who, to his chagrin, got no title from me. That's the sort of man he is, and nothing more. Despite my great respect for old Kutuzov, he continued, we should be a nice set of fellows if we were to wait about and so give him a chance to escape or to trick us. Now that we saw Believe me, in war the energy of young men often shows the way better than all the experience of old cunctators. But in what position are we going to attack him? I have been at the outposts today, and it is imp He wished to explain to Dolgoruk of a plan of attack he had himself formed. Oh, that is all the same, Dolgorukov said quickly, and getting up he spread a map on the table. All eventualities have been foreseen. If he is standing before Brun, and Prince Dolgorukov rapidly but indistinctly explained with other's plan of a flanking movement. Prince Andrew began to reply and to state his own plan, which might have been as good as where others, but for the disadvantage that where others had already been approved. As soon as Prince Andrew began to demonstrate the defects of the latter and the merits of his own plan, Prince Dolgorukov ceased to listen to him and gazed absent-mindedly not at the map. There will be a council of war at Kutuzov's tonight. Though, you can say all this there, remarked Dolgorukov. I will do so, said Prince Andrew, moving away from the map. Whatever are you bothering about, gentlemen, said Bilibin, who, till then, had listened with an amused smile to their conversation and now was evidently ready with a joke. Whether tomorrow brings victory or defeat, the glory of our Russian arms is secure. Except your Kutuzov, there is not a single Russian in command of a column. The commanders are Herr General Wimpfen, Le Comte de Langerin, Le Prince de Liechtenstein. It is not true. There are now two Russians, Milorodovich and Doktorov, and there would be a third, Count Arichiv, if his nerves were not too weak. I wish you good luck and success, Gentlemen, he added and went out after shaking hands with Dolgorukov and Bilibin. On the way home, Prince Andrew could not refrain from asking Kutuzov, who was sitting silently beside him, what he thought of tomorrow's battle. Kutuzov looked sternly at his adjutant and, after a pause, replied, I think the battle will be lost, and so I told Count Tolstoy and asked him to tell the emperor. What do you think, he replied, but... My dear general, I am engaged with rice and cutlets. Look after military matters yourself. Yes, that was the answer I got after Xaya shortly after nine o'clock that evening. We rather drove with his plans to Kutuzov's quarters where the council of war was to be held. All the commanders of columns were summoned to the commander-in-chiefs, and with the exception of Prince Bagration, who declined to come, were all there at the appointed time. We rather who was in full control of the proposed battle. By his eagerness and briskness presented a marked contrast to the dissatisfied and drowsy Kutuzov, who reluctantly, way rather evidently felt himself to be at the head of a movement that had already become unrestrainable. He was like a horse running downhill harnessed to a heavy cart. Whether he was pulling it or being pushed by it he did not know, but rushed along at headlong speed with no time to consider what this movement might lead to. We rather had been twice that evening to the enemy's picket line to reconnoiter personally, and twice to the emperors, Russian and Austrian, to report and explain, and to his head. He was evidently so busy that he even forgot to be polite to the commander-in-chief. 
He interrupted him, talked rapidly and indistinctly, without looking at the man he was addressing, and did not reply to questions put to him. He was bespattered with mud and had a pitiful, weary, and distracted air, though at the same time he was haughty and self-confident. Kutuzov was occupying a nobleman's castle of modest dimensions near Australitz. In the large drawing-room which had become the commander-in-chief's office were gathered Kutuzov himself, Weyrother, and the members of the Council of War. They were drinking tea, and only awaited Prince Bagration to begin the council. At last Bagration's orderly came with the news that the prince could not attend. Prince Andrew came in to inform the commander-in-chief of this, and, availing himself of permission previously given him by Kutuzov to be present at the council, he remained in the room. Since Prince Bagration is not coming, we may begin, said Weyrother, hurriedly rising from his seat and going up to the table on which an enormous map of the environs of Brunn was spread out. Kutuzov, with his uniform unbuttoned so that his fat neck bulged over his collar as if escaping, was sitting almost asleep in a low chair, with his podgy old hands resting. At the sound of Weyrother's voice, he opened his one eye with an effort. Yes, yes, if you please. It is already late, said he, and nodding his head he let it droop and again closed his eye. If at first the members of the council thought that Kutuzov was pretending to sleep, the sounds his nose emitted during the reading that followed proved that the commander-in-chief at that moment was absorbed by a... He really was asleep. Where other, with the gesture of a man too busy to lose a moment, glanced at Kutuzov and, having convinced himself that he was asleep, took up a paper and in a loud... They began as follows. As the enemy's left wing rests on wooded hills and his right extends along Kabelnitz and Sukkelnitz behind the ponds that are there, while we, on the other hand, for this object it is necessary that the first column marches, the second column marches, the third column marches, and so read way or other. The generals seemed to listen reluctantly to the difficult dispositions. The tall, fair-haired General Buckshowden stood, leaning his back against the wall, his eyes fixed on a burning candle, and seemed not to listen or even to exactly opposite way or other, with his glistening wide open eyes fixed upon him and his mustache twisted upwards, sat the ruddy Milorodovich in a military pose, his elbows turned out. He remained stubbornly silent, gazing at Weyrother's face, and only turned away his eyes when the Austrian chief of staff finished reading. Then Milorodovich looked round significantly at the other generals. But one could not tell from that significant look whether he agreed or disagreed and was satisfied or not with the arrangements. Next to where other sat Count Langerin, who, with a subtle smile that never left his typically southern French face during the whole time of the reading, gazed at his delicate fingers which rapidly tore. In the middle of one of the longest sentences, he stopped the rotary motion of the snuff-box, raised his head, and with inimical politeness lurking in the corners of his thin lips interrupted with But the Austrian general, continuing to read, frowned angrily and jerked his elbows, as if to say, You can tell me your views later, but now be so good as to look at the map and listen. A geography lesson, he muttered as if to himself, but loud enough to be heard. Priares Zuske, with respectful but dignified politeness, held his hand to his ear toward Weyrother, with the air of a man absorbed in attention. Doktorov, a little man, sat opposite Weyrother, with an assiduous and modest mind, and stooping over the outspread map conscientiously studied the dispositions and the unfamiliar. He asked Weyrother several times to repeat words he had not clearly heard and the difficult names of villages. Weyrother complied and Doktorov noted them down. When the reading which lasted more than an hour was over, Langerin again brought his snuff-box to rest and, without looking at Weyrother or at any one in particular, began to say how difficult. Langerin's objections were valid, but it was obvious that their chief aim was to show General Weyrother, who had read his dispositions with as much self-confidence as if he were addressing school children, that he had to When the monotonous sound of Weyrother's voice ceased, 
Kutuzov opened his eye as a miller wakes up when the soporific drone of the mill wheel is interrupted. He listened to what Langerin said, as if remarking, So you are still at that silly business, quickly closed his eye again, and let his head sink still lower. Langerin, trying as virulently as possible to sting where others' vanity as author of the military plan, argued that Bonaparte might easily attack instead of being attacked, and so rent we rather met all objections with a firm and contemptuous smile, evidently prepared beforehand to meet all objections be they what they might. If he could attack us, he would have done so today, said he. So you think he is powerless, said Langerin. He has forty thousand men at most, replied we rather, with the smile of a doctor to whom an old wife wishes to explain the treatment of a case. In that case he is inviting his doom by awaiting our attack, said Langerin, with a subtly ironical smile, again glancing round for support to Milorodovich who was near him. But Milorodovich was at that moment evidently thinking of anything rather than of what the generals were disputing about. Muffoy, said he, tomorrow we shall see all that on the battlefield. We rather again gave that smile which seemed to say that to him it was strange and ridiculous to meet objection. The enemy has quenched his fires and a continual noise is heard from his camp, said he. What does that mean? Either he is retreating, which is the only thing we need fear, or he is changing his position. He smiled ironically, but even if he also took up a... Kutuz of here woke up, coughed heavily, and looked round at the generals. Gentlemen, the dispositions for tomorrow, or rather for today, for it is past midnight, cannot now be altered, said he. You have heard them, and we shall all do our duty. But before a battle, there is nothing more important, he paused, than to have a good sleep. He moved as if to rise. The generals bowed and retired. It was past midnight. Prince Andrew went out. The council of war, at which Prince Andrew had not been able to express his opinion as he had hoped to, left on him a vague and uneasy impression. Whether Dolgorukov and Weyrother, or Kutuzov, Langerin, and the others who did not approve of the plan of attack, were right he did not know. But was it really not possible for Kutuzov to state his views plainly to the emperor? Is it possible that on account of court and personal considerations tens of thousands of lives and suddenly, at this thought of death, a whole series of most distant, most intimate, memories rose in his imagination. He remembered his last parting from his father, and he thought of her pregnancy and felt sorry for her and for himself, and in a nervously emotional and softened mood he went out of the hut in which he was billeted with Nesvitsky and began to walk up and down. The night was foggy, and through the fog the moonlight gleamed mysteriously. Yes, Tomorrow, tomorrow, he thought. Tomorrow everything may be over for me. All these memories will be no more. None of them will have any meaning for me. Tomorrow, perhaps, even certainly, I have a presentiment that for the first time I shall have to show all I can do. And his fancy pictured the battle, its loss, the kind, and then that happy moment, that Toulon for which he had so long waited, presents itself to him at last. He firmly and clearly expresses his opinion to Kutuzov, to Weyrother, and to the emperors. All are struck by the justness of his views, but no one undertakes to carry them out, so he takes a regiment. A division stipulates that no one is to interfere with his arrangements but death and suffering, suggested another voice. Prince Andrew, however, did not answer that voice and went on dreaming of his triumphs. The dispositions for the next battle are planned by him alone. Nominally, he is only an adjutant on Kutuzov's staff, but he does everything alone. The next battle is won by him alone. Kutuzov is removed and he is appointed. Well, and then? asked the other voice. If before that you are not ten times wounded, killed, or betrayed well. What then? Well then, Prince Andrew answered himself, I don't know what will happen and don't want to know, and can't, but if I want this want glory, want to be known to men. Yes, for that alone, I shall never tell anyone. 
but, O oh God, what am I to do if I love nothing but fame and men's esteem, death, wounds, and precious and dear as many persons are to me, father, sister, wife, those dearest to me, yet dreadful and unnatural as it seems, I would give them all at once for a moment of glory. The voices were those of the orderlies who were packing up. One voice, probably a coachman's, was teasing Kutuzov's old cook whom Prince Andrew knew, and who was called Tit. He was saying, Tit, I say, Tit, well, returned the old man. Go, Tit, thresh a bit, said the wag. Oh, go to the devil, called out a voice, drowned by the laughter of the orderlies and servants. All the same, I love and value nothing but triumph over them all. I value this mystic power and glory that is floating here above me in this mist, chapter Xiai that same night. His hussars were placed along the line in couples, and he himself rode along the line trying to master the sleepiness that kept coming over him. An enormous space, with our army's campfires dimly glowing in the fog, could be seen behind him. In front of him was misty darkness. Rostov could see nothing, peer as he would into that foggy distance. Now something gleamed gray, now there was something black, now little light seemed to glimmer where the enemy ought. His eyes kept closing, and in his fancy appeared now the emperor, now Denisov, and now Moscow memories, and he again hurriedly opened his eyes and saw close before him the head. Why not? It might easily happen, thought Rostov, that the emperor will meet me and give me an order as he would to any other officer. He'll say, go and find out what's there. There are... Suddenly a distant shout aroused him. He started and opened his eyes. Where am I? Oh, yes, in the skirmishing line. Pass and watchword shaft. Olmutz. What a nuisance that our squadron will be in reserve tomorrow, he thought. I'll ask leave to go to the front. This may be my only chance of seeing the emperor. It won't be long now before I am off duty. I'll take another turn, and when I get back I'll go to the general and ask him. He readjusted himself in the saddle and touched up his horse to ride once more round his hussars. It seemed to him that it was getting lighter. To the left he saw a sloping descent lit up, and facing it a black knoll that seemed as steep as a wall. On this knoll there was a white patch that Rostov could not at all make out. Was it a glade in the wood lit up by the moon, or some unmelted snow, or some white houses? He even thought, I expect it's snow. That spot, a spot won't tatch, he thought. There now, it's not a tatch. Natasha. Sister, black eyes. Nay, Tasha, won't she be surprised when I tell her how I've seen the emperor? Natasha, take my sabretach, keep to the right, your honor. There are bushes here, came the voice of an hussar, past whom Rostov was riding in the act of falling asleep. Rostov lifted his head that had sunk almost to his horse's mane and pulled up beside the hussar. He was succumbing to irresistible youthful, childish drosness. But what was I thinking? I mustn't forget. How shall I speak to the emperor? No, that's not it, that's tomorrow. Oh, yes, Natasha. Sabretach, saber them, whom the hussars, a hussars with mustaches. Along the Tverskaya street rode the hussar with mustaches. I thought about him, too. Just opposite Guriev's house, old Guriev, Oh, but Denisov's a fine fellow. But that's all nonsense. The chief thing is that the emperor is here. How he looked at me and wished to say something, but dared not. Pay and but did wish to say some. How? Pay low. Pay low. No, it was I who dared not. But that's nonsense. The chief thing is not to forget the important thing I was thinking of. Yes. Natasha. Sabretach, oh, yes, yes, that's right, and his head once more sank to his horse's neck. All at once it seemed to him that he was being fired at. What, what, what? Cut them down, what, said Rostov, waking up. At the moment he opened his eyes he heard in front of him, where the enemy was, 
the long-drawn shouts of thousands of voices. His horse and the horse of the hussar near him pricked their ears at these shouts. Over there, where the shouting came from, a fire flared up and went out again, then another, and all along the French line on the hill fires flared up and the shouting grew loud. Rostov could hear the sound of French words but could not distinguish them.